sizes, which I find is often very tricky to map, to map onto a GPU. If you've got, depending on what the function is, if you've got elements of size where, where one sort of item of work is of a size of between 10 and 1,000 elements, it can be tricky to map onto the, thread, the parallel thread execution model because you would typically need to use a whole block of threads to work together on a, a, a chunk of data that size. I always find that's really fiddly to implement. I don't necessarily know I'm going to get good performance. The other thing to be aware of is if you see that a lot of the time the D types are all float 64, that's very slow on consumer GPUs. So if that's the hardware you've got access to, maybe don't um, look at you trying to use a GPU first. Uh, in, as an alternative to using a GPU, if you've got lots of small pieces of data and many function calls, perhaps you can adjust the interfaces of your functions so that instead of passing one item of data to it at a time, perhaps you can make a batch, a batch of items of data um, and then doing all that work in one function call rather than multiple function calls. Then once you've done that, perhaps you can get more performance out of it by using numbers JIT or vectorized decorators to compile that batched function. Another thing you might see is that you might have a, a very generic function that's often called with um, data shapes or, 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 si or shapes or types that could be a particular special case. For exa an example of that would be if you, perhaps if you had um, an, a multi-dimensional solver, but you saw that you were, you were calling it to do 1D solves all the time, um, perhaps it would make more sense if that's, the, if, that's a simple, if that's a simpler case to implement, to implement a 1D solver and use that where it's applicable. Um, so that's it for the Accelerate Data Profiler. Um, I will talk a little bit about Intel's VTune. I think because I'm already running short on time, um, I'll talk a bit about VTune, but I'll skip over the sort of demo bit that I had. Um, so VTune is quite a different tool to the Python standard library and Accelerate Data Profilers. They're event-based profilers. So every time something happens, it records, it records that that happened. So VTune um, in, in does something a little bit different. At regular intervals, it'll sample the call stack and see what's being, being done and then record that. And then at the end of the execution, it can use all those samples to build a statistical profile of what's going on. That's got the advantage that it's quite low overhead. But, um, and you can even tweak the amount of overhead by adjusting the sampling interval. But that does mean that any profile it produces is less than 100% accurate. That doesn't really matter in practice. Most of the time, the profile is accurate enough that you can use the information to guide you anyway. So I had been um, experimenting, with, experimenting with it a little bit recently. Um, uh, so what I was going to talk about was just a, a little bit of the things that I'd found I could use it for and um, what it seemed to be useful for. One of the things that I did like is that it gives you this single um, user interface um, and all one place if, you pa if you're profiling mixed Python code and native code. I've tried it with Anaconda and it seems to just work out of the box with Anaconda. I've also tried it with my system Python 3 and it seems to work with that as well. I haven't tried it with Python 2 because no one's using that anymore, are they? <laughs> um, so, uh, what I think I'll do is just skip out the whole eggs. Uh, how fast? I'll just try and go over this very fast because, well, oh dear, what have I done? Instead of going through the whole example, it's just a couple of examples of some of the views that it can give you to try and put it down a bit. Um, so when you finish executing, it can give you this, this um, summary of the utilization <coughs> of your CPU. So you can see how long, um, for what portion of the program's execution, it, um, uh, for what portion of the program's execution, how well were your CPUs utilized. Um, you can also drill down a little bit more, see what, the, see what particular processes were doing at any point in time of the execution of your program. Um, that, that, so that, that tells you what's happening at different phases in your program, but it doesn't tell you anything about what particular functions are doing. So you can then drill down a bit by looking at the function summary, and then that will give you a list of the individual functions and how well the, the, um, um, the CPU was utilized um, during each of those functions as well. Um, in this particular profile, not many Python functions were showing near the top. But if I scroll down a bit, then I could see that there were some um, Python functions there. Sometimes you have to, it seems like you have to sometimes expand a, 
uh, a native method like PyC function call or something ended in eval to be able to see it, to be able to see some of the Python code. So I would say that VTune is um, the tool to use um, if you've got to profile a mix of native or Python code, or if you're using multiple processes or threads and trying to um, do that by releasing by releasing the GIL. So you might think it's difficult to use multi-threading in Python because of the global interpreter lock, but it turns out that a lot of libraries that you commonly use in data science have at least some functions that would release the GIL. Or if you're writing your own code using Number or Cython, uh, then you could then you could also release the GIL yourself using no GIL. Um, I'm sorry I've skimmed over that so quickly, but if anyone's in, interested in VTune, I'd be happy to talk about that um, later. Just come and have a chat with me. Um, so for the rest of the talk, I was going to talk about the uh, new number features uh, since last year. So when I gave the tutorial last year, the current version of number was 0.18. We're on 0.25 now. The pace of development seems to go quite fast. So there's quite, this is just a selection of some of the new features. Um, I'm going to talk a bit about the first four because these are the ones that I thought that I could um, explain and give some guidance on. Um, the last three are interesting as well. I'll talk about them a little bit at the end. Um, so before I do that, I'm just going to give a qu very quick introduction to Number. So Number is a just-in-time compiler for Python. So you can apply it to specific Python functions that you're interested in speeding up by using the JIT decorator. <coughs> just decorate your function with JIT and then it will compile it. Because its main goal is to make array-oriented computing fast, there's been a lot of work going in to make it support NumPy as well as possible. So a lot of uh, as support for a lot of NumPy functions and array operations. Um, you can get quite a good speed up with it. Um, so this is an example of a Mandelbrot function. If we just take a pure Python version running on CPython and run that, uh, measure the, the execution time, we'll say that runs at a one-time speed. If we, if we use the um, number to JIT compile it, then you can get a speed up of 120 times. Now, not, it's not necessarily going to be the case that you can get such a huge speed up every time, but you can get a lot of big speed ups um, for a lot of different codes with it. So that's one way of using number, to use the JIT decorator to compile a function. The other way to use it is to use its vectorized decorator. So what vectorized does is um, it'll take a function that you write in Python that, that operates on scalars, and then it'll compile them down to a function that's automatically applied <coughs> element-wise to arrays that you pass to it, and that's called a universal function, or a ufunc. What's new here is the ability to um, generate ufuncs with a vectorized decorator that automatically execute in parallel or on a, on a queue to GPU. So here I've got two examples of a function that computes relative difference. One uh, using the, doing it in serial, and then one doing it in parallel. So to, make, to create a parallel or queue to ufunc, you just use the target argument. So for parallel one, target equals parallel, or for queue to target equals queue to. Um, I did a quick benchmark of this on my laptop, and um, comparing the, the, par the serial version and the parallel version, um, the parallel version was about twice as fast on my laptop, which has got two real cores. So um, for a small amount of work, uh, if you're using a vectorized function, you can get a decent speed up there just by adding the target um, to, to create a parallel ufunc. So it's fairly straightforward to use them once you've, once you've graphed how to use the vectorized decorator. There are a couple of other things to be aware of. One is that normally you can just write a function with the vectorized decorator and not specify what the types of the arguments are, and that will just work. There's kind of a not yet implemented um, thing where if you, use, if you just use the parallel target with vectorize and don't specify what the types of the arguments are going to be, the ufunc won't work. So you need to pass in a list of what the argument types are going to be. There is an issue open for that, so you can check back on that issue. It should get closed at some point in the future. Uh, and then you should just be able to use vectorize with the parallel target without specifying what the argument types are. If you're using that target, you should get a speed up for all but the most simple functions. If you've got a really simple function, then it's not going to be bound. It's not going to be sort of computationally bound, so adding more CPU cores to the same problem is not going to remove the bottleneck. If you're thinking about using um, the CUDA target instead, you just need to be aware that there's going to be an overhead when you, because it has to copy data to the GPU, run the ufunc, and then copy the result back. So you need to have a slightly more complex function to be able to get a speed up. That said, it's quite easy to, to experiment with the different targets just by changing target equals parallel or target equals CUDA. So what you can do is just to experiment with them and see which one runs fastest for your use case. 
Um, another new feature in Number is generated functions. So the, pro the problem that one of the problems that you had in Number before was if you um, if if you wanted to um, create a function that did different things for different types, you couldn't do that. If you tried to write a function that way, then you would get a type error. It's possible to write a function that does the same thing to different types, but not different things to different types. So the generated functions in Number are partly um, inspired by generated functions in Julia. They're not as powerful <coughs> because you don't have, um, I think in Julia you have an AST or an expression tree that you can manipulate, but you can't do that here. What you can do is write a function that customizes the dispatching of number so that depending on what types of arguments you are passed, you can dispatch to another function that does something different. Um, so you can dispatch on the argument type. So a type is a scalar or an array or something like that. <coughs> or the argument properties. And the properties <coughs> of, of, a, of them are things like the number of dimensions or the D type of the array. So this is a little bit of an abstract description. So I've got a, a concrete example of, of using a generated function. So what I wanted to try to do was to try and write a one norm function that computes the one norm of a scalar or a matrix or a vector, uh, depending on what you pass into it. So the implementation of each of them is a little bit different because they're all defined differently mathematically. So I could just put the JIT decorator on each of these and then they, they would work if they were JITted. But it would mean that you'd have, to use, you'd have to use the right name, like scalar one norm or vector one norm, depending on what you were passing it. If I tried to com combine these into one function with some branches in and then JIT that, then I would get a type error. For example, if I passed in a scalar, number would be trying to compile this thing which is taking the shape um, as if there's going to be a 2D case. But because scalars don't have a shape, then that would give me the type error. So what I can do instead is use a generated uh, JIT function to implement the one L1 norm function. So uh, to do that, uh, use the generated JIT, JIT decorator. Then you write the function that has uh, an argument list. When you call L1 norm, what it's going to get passed is not the actual arguments itself, but some objects re re representing the type of the arguments. So um, if I called L1 norm with a scalar, then the function would check, th the L1 norm function checks if x is, is, um, is an instance of the number type. If so, then it should dispatch the scalar 1 norm function. Um, if it's been passed an array type, and that, that has um, a property of endim, equal to 1, then it will return the vector 1 norm function. And then if endim is 2, the scalar 1 norm, <coughs> uh, sorry, the matrix 1 norm function. I always like to have an else clause as well that just returns a function that's always going to throw an error, explaining in terms that I can understand what's gone wrong. So um, that's how we've defined uh, the L1 norm function using generated JIT. Let's have a look at how we'd call it. So in this example, we're calling it, so x0 is a number uh, or a scalar, x1 and x2 are a uh, vector and a matrix. So the first three calls will all succeed just fine um, because, um, because we have an implementation that can be used for each of them. Uh, if we try and pass it, this, this array with three dimensions instead, it's going to fall through to our else case and be a, it will raise that type error, say an unsupported type for one norm. So that was a very quick example of a, a generated JIT function. Uh, the general guidelines for the, that I can think of for using them are there's a lot of different types and attributes. So I showed a, examples of a couples there like number and array and endim. You can look at the code in the number.types module to see what types and attributes there are. If you find the ones that I've used in the previous slide to see what they look like, you can have a scroll through and see all the other types as well. So some of those types are, again, things like array, number, integer, and so on. The buffer type is the base type for quite a lot of different things. So you can use that to catch a lot of different cases if you want. Um, I, I do always think it's good to have that, your fallback case that raises an error. Because if your, if your generated JIT function doesn't find a suitable case and it just returns none, then you get a slightly more strange error come out of number, just saying none's not a callable object. Um, how am I actually doing for time? Uh, 
So how long have I got? Ten minutes. Yeah. Oh, brilliant. Okay. Okay. So um, another new feature is JIT classes. So there were JIT classes in number before, <coughs> but they were removed as part of a big, a really big refactor focusing on performance and cleanup. So. Um, There are, there are, there's now JIT classes in number again, but they're quite different to what they were before. So what you can use them in number for now is that they can be used to hold related items together, rela related items of data together within a single object. Um, so one thing you can use that for is, is use them a bit like they're a struct in C. Um, but one of the one of the things that I think that's interesting that you can do with them is to make a transformation where you take something in what's called an array of structs layout and then transform it to what's called a struct of arrays layout. The reason you might do that is if, you, if your code iterates over um, a particular member of every entry uh, of, in an array of structures, then this, this can, this, it, can, it can increase the performance because it's a more efficient way to access all those members. So there's a nice article on what this transformation does from Intel that you can have a read of in depth. But in, in simple terms, what it does is it'll take a set of objects that are all next to each other in memory and then it will sort of transpose their layout so that all of the same member of each of those objects are next to each other in memory. So here we've got some objects. Um, the first one's here. It's X, Y, Z and W are all next to each other. Then the second one, um, X, Y, Z and W are next to each other and so on. If we make this transformation, all the X's are next to each other, all the Y's are next to each other and so on. Um, so what I've got on the next few slides is an example of making this transformation by using JIT classes. So before looking at the JIT class implementation, um, the original layout, which is going to be an array of structs, um, this is the original layout using an array of structs. Um, so I did that using a structured D-type in NumPy. Or well, one way you could do this is using a structured D-type. So we create a D-type um, with what the uh, members of it are and what their types are. And then we in, then instantiate um, an array of that, that, uh, of that structure. Then supposing we wanted to iterate over all the x's in that array to initialize them somehow, then we can just write a loop over the array and then index into it, first using the offset into the array, and then what the member is. Um, next, um, how, how would we rewrite that as a struct of arrays using a JIT class? So to, to use a JIT class, the first thing you do, um, you need to pr produce a specification. And this specification tells number what the, uh, what the names of the members of the class are and what, the, uh, and what, what, the, what their types are. Then to write a JIT class, use the JIT class decorator and pass it the specification. Then you can write the class as if you're writing a normal Python class. I've only included a constructor here on this example, but you could have other methods on the JIT class as well. Then you can create an instance of it use, um, just by calling the class like you would a normal Python class. One thing to note here is that unlike in the structured D-type, um, where X, Y, Z, and W were all scalars, here one instance of the JIT class is holding arrays of Xs, arrays of Ys, and arrays of Zs. So it, this is the structure of those arrays. Um, when it comes to performing that initialization that we just that, that we saw in the previous um, in this sorry when it comes to initializing all the x's again um, the original implementation using the, the uh, structs of arrays well that's the original implementation when uh, we're doing it with the This implementation is initializing the, this, the, the, the structs of arrays in the JIT class in the same way. Um, we just iterate over a range. So instead of taking the length of one of the arrays, what I often do with a JIT class is to give it, if it's a structs of arrays, is to give it a member called n that just records the length of each of those arrays in it, because I think it's more elegant than taking the length of randomly of one of the arrays in it. Then uh, we can index into it first um, by the member, and this time by the offset. So we've transposed the indices, just like the layout has been transposed in memory. Um, so um, some guidelines for using JIT classes. I didn't show in the previous example, but 
because they're good for holding relate, uh, related um, collections of related data. One thing you can do is if you have a lot of arguments to a JIT function that always go together, you could create a JIT class just to store those in and then store all the, um, and then pass one JIT class argument rather than a, a whole set of arguments. So that would reduce the number of parameters to the JIT function. Um, but I think the more interesting use is to, is to increase performance by making this array of structs destructive arrays transformations. A couple of things to be aware of are at the moment using underscores in, this, in the member names for a JIT class aren't supported, but that's going to be fixed soon. Um, another thing is it, a common mistake to make when you're using JIT classes is to assign to a field that's not been declared in the specification or to assign something that's the wrong type. Um, or a different type to what was declared in the specification. For example, um, if the specification said a variable was going to be, uh, a member was going to be int 32, but it was float 64, you'll get a, um, a le an error out. Um, it, it will try and, t it will sort of tell you what the types were. Um, like we can see, it's, it says you can't, in you, you can't insert a float star um, at a place where, there's an I where you're supposed to put an I32. So those type names do look a little bit different because, they've put, because they're LLVM type names rather than um, something from a higher level. But usually you can guess what it means. Um, so the final feature that I was going to talk about was uh, number support for, for, for calling, um, an calling CFFI wrapped functions. So CFFI is a C foreign function in interface for Python. And I really like using it a lot. Um, what it does is it will give you wrappers to C libraries, but instead of you having to do something tedious like actually writing the wrapper yourself, it can just read a C header file um, and then generate the wrapper for you. Uh, Roman did give a, a talk last year um, at PyData London on why C extensions are evil, but I think it has a corollary, which is that CFFI is really awesome because it makes it so easy to do these things. So it's got two modes. There's the inline mode. A number can just work with inline uh, modules uh, or inline, inline CFFI wrappers. Um, so an inline, inline is when you compile and generate the wrapper at runtime. The out of line is where you use a previously compiled wrapper. Um, and there is a little bit of extra work to do with number to get that to work, um, just so that it can recognize the type information. So I do have a, a, a quick demo of using CFFI <coughs> and number together. So the goal of this demo was to um, wrap into Intel's vector mass library and use it from number. So vector mass library is a collection of fast functions that run on, uh, run on array. So it's got a, like a vectorized sign, vectorized cosine, and so on. It, there's a lot of functions in there, so it'd be really quite time consuming to wrap it by hand. So in general, this is, this is more an example of a particular procedure that I would generally use when trying to wrap a, a library with CFFI rather than being focused on the example of VML itself. Um, if you're interested in using vector, uh, functions from vector math libraries from within Python, then it's definitely worth having a look at Accelerate from Continuum because they're all wrapped up in there as, uh, as U functions, so they're a lot more convenient to use. Um, so I know I'm running short on time, so I'll just It's over. Yeah. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> you, you have, it has eight minutes left, so if you wrap over the next yeah. three minutes. OK. OK, so I'll skip that demo, but the notebook is in, in the exercises. Um, so the other um, number features that I wasn't going to talk about, but I think are interesting, is the ability to extend number. Before, if you wanted to jitter function, um, but you didn't have time to, so I've got time on the mind now. <laughs> um, but, you didn't, but there was a particular unsupported function, then um, you were stuck. What you can do now is extend number and add support for that function. But it's quite a complicated topic, which would need a talk in itself. There is a detailed section in the manual, though, that's worth having, worth having a look at if you want to extend number. Um, recently, there's more improved support for, for using number in the context of Spark and Dask. So now CUDA works with Spark and Dask. And there's been a lot of performance issues fixed as well. Also, all the time, there's support for more NumPy functions being added. So it's worth checking from time to time the listed NumPy supported functions in the manual with each release to see if that may, to see if it um, uh, allows for more use of number with your use cases. 
Um, that's it. It's over. <laughs> Did I have time for questions? Or? Yes. Okay. Hi. What's the relative performance of the two approaches to vectorize one, one using classes, one using AOS? For oh, AOS and SOA. Um, using classes and not using classes. Oh, right. Um, I don't think there's much of a of a, a knock-on effect of using the, the classes because they're all compiled to native code anyway. They're not classes. Um, you don't expect them. Ju just, just, just taking something that's um, a struct and just replacing it with JIT classes is not necessarily going to be faster. If you make that transfer, if you also use JIT classes to make that transformation, then it can be faster. The reason it can be faster is because of what Simon was saying about SIMD. It doesn't provide any hints to the C compiler. Oh, so it, in a way, it does provide hints to the compiler because, um, uh, in this case. Um, this would compile down to a very simple tight loop just in yeah. increment and index. Sorry, this case wouldn't compile down to just a, a simple tight loop increment and index, but this would. So. The